Or if you want to come up, we'll just start talking. <laughs> Welcome to 1896. We're doing this the old-fashioned way. No microphones, no speakers. We just have to project as actors did project in 1896, although the Southern Theater was designed to help them with their projection. But I want to start by introducing today's speaker, who played a pivotal role not just here, but in many places. We went to law school together. We graduated together. We never met each other. We later figured out we had one class together with 225 students in it. <laughs> and so we both arrived at the same law firm that had made us an offer, the Voris firm, on the same Tuesday morning in May about 20 minutes apart and started, and that's when we met. Fast forward two years to a Tuesday in May, and Larry and I are having lunch together, and Larry says, you know, there's a public meeting tonight to talk about why the effort to save the Ohio theater has failed, and it's going to be torn down. Neither of us had had any involvement, but Larry knew about it. <laughs> He'd been in the Ohio, excuse me. <clears throat> and so he invited me to come and I went. And that was the beginning of our involvement with the Ohio Theater. That Friday, well, we met two other people. There were only two people in the city of Columbus who on that night said we should not give up. The late Bob Carlsberger, an architect, whose offices were right down the street here, late years later, and Jean Whalen, wife of the symphony conductor. On Friday night, we got together in Dick and Jane Oman's living room. He was executive uh, secretary of the Columbus Foundation. And there was Ken Ackerman, who would then play a really pivotal role in saving the Ohio theater. That's how it began. Uh, for Larry, saving theaters is something he has done. Been involved in the Ohio, the Palace negotiated the acquisition, the Southern, the Drexel, the Lincoln, the Schubert, yeah. and he's been involved in restoring many of those theaters. Started the first big project that I recall was the Galbraith Pavilion on the Ohio. That whole project, he was chair of the building committee and very involved in that project in selecting the architect uh, and do, working on that. He's gone on to completely rebuild the whole backstage area of the Ohio. This is another project we'll talk about. He has done all those things. But theaters are not only that, his love. In 1975, there were seven homes out on Jefferson Avenue that were scheduled to be demolished. Larry formed the Jefferson Avenue Association. All seven homes have been restored and stand today. One of them is the Thurber House. When he retired from the practice of law, he moved down High Street to a building right up, right over there, the F&R Lazarus Company, and led the restoration as president of Columbus Downtown Development Corporation to put that million square feet back into use as offices. He has done more historic rehabilitation than anybody I know. But as we've talked about it, the project here was one of Difficulty, and I think Larry would agree with me, restoring the Southern Theater was perhaps technically the most difficult project of all the restorations that he has been involved in. I would say so, yes. Uh, and the reason for that is something like the Ohio that ultimately required 
uh, more expenditures, the expansion of the stage and all of that uh, came in increments. Uh, and, and we could, uh, in, in 1969, when we uh, formed CAFA, uh, uh, as soon as we acquired the property uh, in September of 1969, in that same month, we were in operations as a performing arts center. Uh, we didn't have the deepened stage at that time and all that, but nonetheless, we were in operations. That sort of thing was impossible with the Southern uh, because as, as maybe we'll get into a little later, uh, the, the property was uh, simply unusable until it had been completely redone. Yeah. So when did we start talking about the Southern Theater? Well, actually, we started talking about it in 1969 when we were doing the Ohio, because as as we looked at the 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 need for the Ohio and what we were doing, uh, Bob Carlsberger had already prepared a model uh, of of a development of downtown that was necessary to save the Ohio to have things around it and uh, become uh, 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 the convention center. Uh, and it's still in 1969, as we were wor working on acquiring and initiating the operations in the Ohio, uh, we looked at what was necessary uh, you know, for the development uh, that could help preserve the theater and, and, and allow its eventual expansion. Uh, so uh, what, what we did is uh, decided to make the, the expansion, make uh, what's become what became Capital South, uh, three blocks from south of, uh, of the Capitol uh, instead of two. And of course, we had that in mind at the time about the Southern, that took us down to the Southern Theater. Uh, and, and, and looking around uh, at, at the theater situation at the time, we of course uh, were working on the Ohio. We were aware of the palace, which was operating at that time, uh, the Hartman and the Southern, which was also to a certain extent operating at the time. Uh, and the concept was we needed to uh, basically save all of those theaters. Uh, and as Scott likes to say, we got three out of four. So. <laughs> yeah, and I will now make my confession I was I was negotiating, and it was pretty early trying to get the Hartman and failed. And it got torn down and made into a parking lot to serve the office building, more's the pity. So getting a small theater became even more critical. And this was it here. But there were issues with that. We had lots of other things to do and couldn't get started. And we also knew that to save the Southern Theater, one had to save this hotel, the Great Southern Fireproof Hotel. Uh, and how to do that. It gradually closed. It became apparent uh, that by uh, the early 80s, that it was probably going to be demolished, it was out of business, the theater was closed. And we began to look, how do we save everything? Well, Kappa was not in the hotel business, and we, but we needed a developer with vision. And so we began talking and who did we arrive at? Well, uh, we, we arrived at the ideal person who Scott had worked with, uh, before on, on, on projects, and that was Bill Bonner and his wife, Barbara. Uh, and and as well, we can talk about as, as we go on here, uh, he was instrumental uh, in, in fact, pulling together everything that needed to be done to uh, redevelop uh, the hotel. And the plan was to redevelop the theater so that uh, that could get done uh, and be able to have Kappa then step in uh, with a theater that was already paid for and in operation. That was the plan. Things don't always go according to plan. <laughs> now, why was Bill our first 
choice, the one we thought would have the vision of how to do this. Like our speaker last week, Bill had gone off to school in the state of New York, but he had not gone to the Culinary Institute. He'd gone to the Cornell Hotel and Restaurant School. He understood the restaurant business. He had built a, one of the, I think the first office building up in Bush Boulevard, opened the first white tablecloth restaurant in the North End, Suite 61, and then done a development for which he became well known called The Continent, a development anchored by the French market, individual food stands at one end, anchored by a cinema at the other end, all entertainment with restaurants scattered all the way down in between the housing on top, the shops and restaurants on the bottom. Does it sound a little like Easton? Yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill was ahead of his time and he did that and then had sold it. I got to meet him when it was sold uh, and did some other projects but he looked like the perfect developer. So in the early 80s, as we were afraid this theater and hotel were going to become rubble, like the Hartman had become, we invited Bill and Barbara to come down here, got permission to show it. Walked them in, they looked at the hotel, the lobby space, the ballroom up, upstairs, which is magnificent and then walk into the theater. Pretty dark, pretty dusty, couldn't see so much. And I believe they fell in love with that theater and made this their project. It would not have happened without Bill and Barbara Bond. That's certainly true. <laughs> and Don also underplays his role in that. Uh, as we put all this together, uh, 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 the two of us worked together. Scott took the lead on all the uh, the paperwork uh, that was in his area of expertise, uh, the legal paperwork uh, to assemble uh, the, the uh, basically what would be called a limited partnership to do, do to do the development uh, with uh, uh, Bill and Barbara Bonner as the developers. Uh, uh, go so well, and the plan was to do the same thing that had been done with the Ohio, to develop not only to restore the theater, but also to develop an endowment to help support the operations. We got access to a half a, a, half a million dollars ur urban development action grant. Uh, and the deal was that the UDAG as it was repaid would then go in, the payments would go into an endowment to support the theater. And so everything was in contract. We were ready to go. And the night before the closing, that blew up when the, the, the decision was made at the, on the city's part that the UDAG would have to be repaid to the city and not to the theater. And we walked away from the deal. The end. Nothing, no more story to tell. Except some months later, unfortunately, Bill Manick died. His estate wanted to sell. There was a renegotiation and a new deal was struck, which did not include the restoration of the Southern Theater. But the Bonners bought the hotel, literally moved down here, spent their time restoring this hotel, put a new roof and a new and tuck pointed all the brick, basically waterproofed the theater. And there it sat as the hotel went back into business. And Larry, I think you remember vividly when the hotel went into business. Uh, yeah, yes, we had, uh, <clears throat> we got into uh, the, uh, uh, about uh, 1985, as I recall, the, we needed to get it in operation in order to uh, be able to use uh, certain kinds of deductions and all for the year 
So uh, we actually put it into operation on, on December 31st, 1985, <laughs> with, uh, I think, three tenants occupying the hotel. I uh, Scott and his wife uh, had one. I, my wife had, had another room. I think there was a, a, another one or two. Uh, and so the hotel opened with, uh, with her business on December 31st. Talk about a soft opening. <laughs> So there, so there we were, and there was the theater next door, waiting, contributed to Kappa, and waiting while the money was raised, and that took what? How long? Well, from that point, uh, uh, it it it, uh, it it took from that time uh, until we didn't open the the, the theater until. Uh, 1897. We were aiming to get it up open in 1890. 19, excuse me, um, 100 years. <laughs> uh, and and uh, 1996, 100 years after the 1896 original opening, we didn't quite make it because it was into 1997. <laughs> so, in looking at this theater, uh, one can go back in history to something I was familiar with growing up in Chicago. Uh, my grandmother had attended, and that was the Columbian Exposition of 1892. And you can explain the relevance because you got into the architecture. Right. The, uh, the, the whole so the source of, uh, the, uh, of the hotel and theater uh, really came from two uh, events. Uh, one, the 1892 Columbian Exposition, and two, the, I think it was January, the early at any rate, of 1893, of the gigantic fire that took down the Chittenden Hotel, the Henrietta Theater, and the Park Theater that were adjacent. There have been other theater fires and theaters that burned down. They were notorious. And that great fire what started at one of the theaters, I think it was the Henrietta, uh, but it took down the hotel and everything else. While we're on that subject, at that time, there was a real division in the downtown between the merchants on the north side, where most of the development was occurring, and the merchants on the south side, which there was little development, basically south of the Lazarus store. Uh, uh, and so when, uh, uh, when the, uh, Chittenden Hotel burned down, the, uh, merchants, uh, uh, in the southern, uh, uh, part of the downtown, uh, developed the idea of, uh, building a fireproof hotel, uh, and theater, uh, uh, and they were, they were able to do that. The, one of the uh, primary uh, people uh, leading that effort uh, 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 was the Lazarus family. Uh, a little fun tidbit is uh, uh, the two people that were heading up the family at the time, uh, uh, Fred Lazarus and Robert Lazarus, uh, had a little different disagreement. Fred was very enthusiastic about the Great Southern Hotel project Robert, not so much. Robert at that time, however, was scheduled to go off and did go off on a long ex uh, excursion around Europe. And so he left. And when he came back, he found that Fred had put together all of the other uh, people and they were in fact on their way to building the, the hotel. Which is why you will see Fred's name on the plaque out in the lobby of the people who originally built this hotel and you will not find Robert's name. <laughs> Robert did later make major contributions to it. So the Lazarus family, in fact, uh, uh, participated. And FNR Lazarus was the first big contributor to Kappa to save the Ohio theater. So getting back to the other point, in 1892, uh, in the Columbian Exposition, the uh, a, a theater was built by the strange name of the auditorium. Uh, I, I think it's because it has to do with the sound in an, in an auditorium. Uh, 
but whatever, that's its name. It's still there today. Uh, and it was considered a remarkable theater because it was very large, still is very large, uh, but it had for the first time concentric arches coming out from the stage, ever higher. Just uh, And because the acoustics were so good and because so many people came to the uh, exposition and went to the auditorium theater, there was sort of a craze, if you will, around the United States for several years. And many new theaters that were being built were built with concentric arches. The uh, uh, Southern uh, was, the construction must have started probably in 1894, that kind of range. Uh, uh, and we know for sure that at least one of the architects uh, uh, from Chicago came out and assisted in the development of the, the theater. And when it was done, the theater was in Opera House. Remember, that's what it was designed to be. It was called the Opera House. Uh, had fabulous acoustics. And everybody loved it and, and for all kinds of reasons. All around the country, so far as I know, all the other theaters, there may, there may be something I don't know about, but by and large, all the other theaters built with concentric arches had very inadequate acoustics and people stopped building. After the, in the 1890s, they just stopped building them because they weren't any good. The jumping ahead, what, what we learned uh, as we were working on the, uh, the renovation was why that is. Our acoustician explained that when the sound comes off the stage and it hits the concentric arches coming out, those arches bring the sound back down focused. And if that sound focuses three or four feet above your head or down at your feet, let me see, you say, I, I can't hear very well. It's ever been as loud. It's just like a photograph that's out of focus. And you think you can't see it, the, the photograph very well because it's out of focus. Same thing happens. The, for either for great design or great luck, <laughs> the concentric arches in the Southern are exactly the right height as they come up to match the rake of the house, the slope of the seats coming up so that the sound comes back down focused at head level. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what makes, that's a, a critical piece of what makes the acoustics so good uh, in, uh, in the Southern. So now fast forward, Larry is meeting with the engineers and architects who are making proposals to restore the Southern theater and he's going to mess all this up <laughs> because your question question demand to them was what as we interviewed them i i would ask them about the the acoustics and and not wanting to have any sound from the mechanical systems or anything to show up uh, and everybody we interviewed would say things like well, we can get it down to 18 decibels or so I could get it down to 16 decibels. And I said, no, to each of them, I, uh, that's not what I want. I want to be able to sit in that theater when it's empty and you turn on the HVA system, HVAC system, and I can't hear it. And it was, it was people somewhere, you, you can't do that, except for one man. <laughs> His eyes sort of lit up. And he said, well, he said, that's really difficult, but you can do it, but, but you've got to take all the machinery and separate it out from the building. Uh, and he said, that's, and you can't have any of the vibrations from the machinery come into the actual building. Everything has to be attenuated, every duct coming through, every, everything. The building cannot be uh, uh, firmly attached to, to the theater itself. No vibrations can come through. And then he said, and the sound, a lot of the sound you hear is the air tumbling inside the ducts. He said, you have to have really big ducts. 
Uh, and they said they have to have them. So when they turn, they're, they're very big. So the air just slowly makes the turn and it doesn't have, uh, go like waves like the ocean. And then the vents, the vents have to be very big. And you can't have fans pushing them in except from a great distance away, very slowly. And things have to settle in naturally to do all of this. And he said, I was working on another theater and I, I tried to get this design. They wouldn't do it because it was more expensive and it, and it was unnecessary. That's our man. That's who we use. And uh, when, when you look at the theater the next time you go by, look at the side where we had, the alley was closed, closed off the alley, uh, and we have the loading dock beside the building. All the mechanicals are in that building, and, and everything is completely attenuated. Uh, every pipe that goes through it, everything, every duct, everything, so that no vibrations come from that mechanicals. And you can actually get in the ducts underneath the theater and walk in parts of it. They're very big. And the air comes out very slowly, much less controlled, but nonetheless functional. Uh, so we have met my standard of uh, you can turn the system on. Well, we should have thought you had, but <laughs> who knew? And I would say, did you hear that? Close the alley. He closed the alleys around the Ohio to expand the backstage and so forth, and for the Galbraith Pavilion. Larry's closed more alleys than this <laughs> than anybody I know. In everything he's worked on, he keeps closing alleys. <laughs> and one street, <laughs> Tau Street. Uh, not, not only that, he even relocated. The, the, he used to load shows into the theater by, by some big doors uh, in the back of the theater. And he moved, built new loading docks to load the theater in. And those doors are gone. I guess you can't do Ben Hur on stage anymore. <laughs> no. The uh, Scott's reference there is uh, in 1897, when the, 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 the theater, 1896, the theater opened. Uh, it was the premier theater for 18 years, up until the Hartman uh, was built. Uh, uh, and all the best shows and biggest events were there at, at, at the Southern. And uh, an example was the Ben-Hur. And they, they did Ben-Hur with one of the scenes of the chariot race mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, as I understand it, two live horses with a chariot, with, a, with, the, with the horses racing on a treadmill so they didn't move off the stage but they had people standing by with the uh stage doors in front of the horses so if the treadmill broke down <laughs> now that's a show <laughs> so you notice the floor gets completely torn out the HVAC put in were all bigger, so you had to redo the, the the seats completely, where the seats would be located on the floor. Uh, so who knew whether it would work? And then you had to put the floor back in. And now you're toward the end, and now now the typical end of project little problems come up. Do you want to talk about the floor in there? Uh, <clears throat> Well, there are endless problems. Uh, as Scott was saying, uh, what, what we ended up doing was we, we preserved the, the building uh, basically exactly as it was in 1896. Uh, uh, we can talk about lots of things about it, but for example, light bulbs. And in and, and, and 1896, light bulbs in a place like that was a real special thing. It, uh, they called them Edison bulbs at the time. Uh, so we've we worked on preserving all, all of that sort of thing. The uh, What we ended up having to do was to take out the entire floor of both the house and the stage down to the dirt we dug down about an additional four feet, five feet, something like that, 
the the foundations on buildings back in 1896 went to the center of the earth and so that, that was not a problem <laughs> uh, 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 and put uh, uh, dressing rooms etc underneath uh, the uh, the house uh, floor and, and build over it the code regulations would not allow us to rake the floor the way it was originally raked because it was too steep by code. So we had to step it. And, and we also then widened the, the distance between the seats as we put in seats. We took out the seats that were there that were not the original seats. We, we knew the design of the original seats, had them basically copied. Uh, and, and so we put them in, but separated them. And what we had to do is be careful as we moved these seats and had the stepping coming up that it had to be where people's heads were the same distance underneath those concentric arches that they were originally with the rake of the, of the floor. Uh, and, and we did that. And then we had to put in uh, lots of places where the air could come in underneath the seats without having you hear any sound of it coming in. If you next time you're in the theater, look under your seats around, you'll see lots of little caps uh, which are there to allow the uh, air to come in underneath the seats. Then there also feeds from the top in a different way. But cost was an issue. And as I recall, you told me it was going to be a concrete floor. Well, the, the floor had to, the, the, the new floor had, had to be concrete. Uh, and we, we were at the end of, of the design process and the construction process. Uh, and money was tight. We had a meeting one day in the, uh, in the office. Uh, and it was decided that we couldn't afford to put the wooden floor over top of the concrete floor, that we would just put the seats on the concrete floor. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think I was the low person saying, we can't do that. It, it, it won't look right. You, when you look down from the balcony or you walk in, uh, even on, on, on the orchestra level, and you see a concrete floor with everything else being soft, and wooden looking in, in golds and grays and all, all kinds of uh, decorations. Uh, but it was decided we just didn't have the money to do it, even though it was in the plan to do it. Uh, so I left. And to Doug Kreidler's uh, great credit, I got a call that afternoon. <laughs> and he said, Larry, we're going to put in the wooden floor. Uh, and uh, I and he always uh, gave credit afterwards about how important it was. And if you think about it, the next time you're in the theater, particularly if you have to be up in the balcony, look down and see the the, the wooden floor and how it fits in so perfectly. And you can imagine instead some sort of painted gray piece of concrete and how how unsatisfactory that would be. There was also a bit of an issue, as I recall, with the marquee. There had been a movie theater type marquee tacked onto the front of the theater, which I think had been taken down by this point. The, the theater was, uh, in its history, all kinds of things happened to it. But in 1948, it was completely redone as a movie house, simply a movie house. Uh, it was. It was. The stage was still there, and, and when uh, Bill Manick was uh, eventually in charge of it, he had the uh, uh, on his the American cap, cavalcade of country music uh, on Saturdays or something. Used the stage and, until eventually the theater was in essence condemned. It was closed down. Uh, but in 1948, they came in uh, and repainted everything in a gaudy kind of fashion, lowered the ceilings in the lobby, uh, uh, chipped off some of the, the, the front stone, put a, a, a marquee on and a sign of the Southern Theater, all, all not original at all. Uh, and so when we got it, as we went through uh, finishing up, one of the last 
touches uh, was we didn't have the money for the to have the, the southern uh, theaters uh, assigned. It's out there now. Uh, the original was long gone, but we have photographs of it. And, uh, and the company here in Columbus looked at it and said they could exactly, from the photographs to the inch, duplicate them. Uh, but we couldn't afford it. Uh, and uh, so as we're within a couple of months or so of opening, Bill Eagles uh, put up the, the money, which was $15,000, as I recall, which in today's world, I guess, is 60 70,000, I'm not sure what it would equate to, and paid for the, the signs up there now, which is an exact uh, replica of the 1896. But we, uh, all those kind of details got finished up at the last minute. And so all of that leads up to opening night. And here's the guy who's torn the theater apart, put it back together so it looks just like it looked in 1896. And does it work? Mm -hmm. How do you do well, opening night? Oh. Well, <laughs> the uh, opening night, uh, it was finished. Uh, <laughs> and there's a tradition in theaters that on an opening night, uh, you take a picture of the audience. Uh, and usually everybody can make sure the theater's packed or every scene's filled. Uh, and so we did that on the reopening. Uh, and people came in uh, and were, uh, I think it thawed with the theater because I'll back up for a second. Over the, the years we were doing this, Scott and I worked on this for 28 years from 1969 to, to 1997. That's 28 years. At the time we started fiddling, let's get this done. It took us that 28 years worth of work. So uh, we're coming up on, on opening night and we got the crowd in uh, and we explained to the audience uh, that we were going to follow the tradition and take a picture of the audience. But the, uh, the theater, because it had relatively dim light. And that, that was back in the days when you could, didn't have cell phones that can take a picture in, in near darkness. Uh, it had to be a time exposure. So you had the photographer on stage with the old fashioned kind of looking camera mm -hmm. and all that. All, it was explained that it was going to be about uh, five seconds uh, uh, of exposure and nobody should move during that period of time. <laughs> So everybody got themselves and settled into their seat, uh, upright, smile on their face, every, everything. And the photographer goes over to the camera, pushes down a little thing to start the, the, the timing. Everybody's frozen. Everybody relaxed. Everybody in the theater heard the click of the camera mm. all at the same time. Just the click of the camera. Mm. Everybody real. That's perfect to <laughs> So there is some of the story. Uh, President Manana will close the meeting. Chad is going over to make sure that the theater is open. Mm -hmm. You're all invited if you have a few minutes. Uh, leave any time you want, but come over. Larry will take questions over in the theater and point out some of the things so you can see them physically. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, that, uh, that was amazing. Uh, I just, uh, I'm so appreciative of a lot of our guests that we've had, members. Can you imagine what they've done and what they sacrificed all those years for us to appreciate today. When we go to the opera, when we go to, the, we just sit there and we, you know, and we enjoy it. Knowing what went into it and your time, um, I mean, it's a fascinating. Thank you so much. So, again, can you?
if you want to uh, take a tour, please walk over there. I think it's 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 worth it. You can ask questions. Um, just wrapping up here, as you go through your week today, this week, please remember to live by the four-way test of principle. Uh, have a nice day, have a nice week, and I'll see you next, next Tuesday. Thank you.